Hello, this is uh, Stefan Lorenz with High Lonesome Bird Tours and today I would like to talk about our Colorado tour uh, that we do in spring for prairie chickens, grouse and more. And I'm glad you can join me and I hope you will enjoy this brief overview of our tour. This is one of our most popular tours. Uh, we uh, do this tour every year. We've been doing it for more than 15 years and I've been running it for the last five years. It's one of my favorite tours. We get to see lots of fascinating landscapes, wildlife, and of course some of the most iconic birds of North America and some of the neatest display and spectacular licks of these grouse and prairie chickens. And there are lots of uh, rumors and legends about this tour, long driving times, lots of coffee, early mornings, and uh, cold days. And I want to clarify some of those rumors and um, give you a better understanding and overview of what this tour is like. So let's get started and take a look at the route. Uh, the tour starts in Denver at the airport and from Denver we head south to Pueblo and from Pueblo uh, we spend one night there from Pueblo we actually head to Kansas into the Garden City area or near there depending on which lake we visit. We now go to Kansas because the lesser prairie chicken has become very rare and unreliable in eastern Colorado, but there's a great spot in Kansas now where we can see good numbers of them. After uh, one night there, we head to Ray, which is in the uh, northeastern corner of the state, and we spend a night there. And from Ray, we swing all the way back. We leave the short grass prairies, the eastern plain of Colorado, and we enter the Rocky Mountains uh, by visiting the Silverthorne area. From Silverthorne we head south into the Gunnison Basin and here we spend two nights in the town of Gunnison. So this is a great uh, break right here. We do have an early morning there but also an early night. And from Gunnison we head west to Grand Junction near the border with Utah and that's already sandstone country and very arid and we see several species of birds we don't see anywhere else on the tour. And then we head to the northwestern corner of Colorado to Craig and then uh, swing over to Walden in the very northern part of the state. Walden is a small town situated in the least populated county of uh, Colorado with lots of open space and lots of wildlife. And from Walden we swing back to Denver uh, completing this figure eight loop. Usually we cover between 2400 to 2600 miles on this tour which sounds like a lot, but it's broken up into many smaller drives and even the longer transfers are broken up by birding stops and so on. So we do cover quite a bit of distance and we usually see uh, more of Colorado than, than some of the locals have that have lived there for, for years. So the route depends on lek availability and sometimes weather. Uh, we run this tour during early April. It's 11 days long. And during that time of year, we can still expect some snow, uh, sometimes even snowstorms. So we have to be prepared in terms of clothing. And also occasionally we have to maybe change the plan a bit or uh, do a detour to avoid some of the weather. In recent years, we had great luck and we were able to visit all the sites we plan to visit. And hopefully it continues like that in future tours and I'm sure it will. So for transport, we use 15 passenger vans. Uh, we usually put uh, only seven participants into the van. Uh, for larger groups, we use two vans. For slightly smaller groups, we may have a van and an SUV. The SUV is great for luggage. Here we are out at the Pawnee National Grasslands birding for long spurs and mountain plovers. To give you a quick overview of some of the landscapes we see, they're extremely varied. We visit uh, the short grass prairies of eastern Colorado, here again the Pawnee National Grasslands. We head high into the Rocky Mountains. Here we are near Monarch Pass and like I said this time of the year, uh, still lots of snow on the ground in the mountains. Here's a great view from Loveland Pass. Um, again, April is still prime skiing and snowboarding time in Colorado. And here's a great view of the Black Canyon of the Gunnison National Park, another landscape highlight of the tour in the Gunnison Basin. Here our group is enjoying the view, a really unique landscape feature and always a highlight of the tour. We also make a stop at Colorado National Monument in far western Colorado 
and you can see it looks very similar to what you would expect to see in Utah, another landscape highlight. And Western Colorado is quite arid already. Here we are hiking in one of the canyons looking for uh, the non-native chucker actually. So let's look at the tour in a bit more detail. So we start in Pueblo, uh, we meet at the airport and then drive south to Pueblo, have a welcome dinner there, and then the next morning we head out and bird a little bit in the foothills just west of Pueblo before heading east. Our first chicken of the tour uh, is actually not a grouse, it is a New World quail, the scaled quail, and there's a great spot near Pueblo where we can see several of these. Really finely marked quail with a beautiful crest. In this particular spot we also see several species we don't see elsewhere on the tour, like a curve belt thrasher, canyon towhee, so we are in southern Colorado here, so several species reached in northern range, li range limits here. As we head uh, east into the Great Plains, uh, we will start seeing horned larks by the hundreds. A very common species in the plains during that time of year. And it's not unusual to drive a secondary road and flush one every 50 feet or encounter large flocks. And among these, we always keep an eye out for long spurs, of course. So horned lark, very common, nevertheless, uh, a striking bird to look at. We also make stops at several lakes and reservoirs to look for shorebirds and waterfowl and grebes. Uh, there are some great places to compare western grebe, which you see here with the less common Clark's grebe. And as we head further east, uh, we start seeing good numbers of raptors, like Swainson's hawks, that have just returned from their wintering grounds in South America. So they just start arriving at the beginning of April. We also usually encounter one or two ferruginous hawks. This species arrives a little bit later, so there aren't that many around that time of year, but we can usually find one or two. And they really key in on prairie dog colonies, one of their favorite prey. And that time of year, we can also expect some of the rough-legged hawks to still be around. So beginning of April is a great time of overlap. The rough-legged hawks are still here on their wintering quarters, while some of the other migrants are arriving from the south, making for a great raptor tally overall. And it's usually not too difficult to find a great horned owl either roosting along the way or even on a nest. We arrive in Kansas where we spend the night near Scott City and then depending on which lake we visit we head out early in the morning. Um, some of the lakes are on private property and some on nature conservancy property. And we are looking particularly for the lesser prairie chicken an endangered species that has declined dramatically, uh, more than 95%, and its range has really contracted. Now it's only found in New Mexico, Texas, Oklahoma, and Kansas, and a little bit of Colorado still. But uh, we have a great spot where we can visit a lake that has up to 20 or 30 displaying males. Uh, it differs from the greater prairie chicken by having a deeper red uh, air sac, which is not the same color as the comb as you can see in this image here, and overall it's also paler and grayer with a little less heavy barring on the underparts, and its display is quite different. Interestingly, for a long time people didn't realize that there are lesser prairie chickens in that part of Kansas. Uh, I believe landowners just thought they had greater prairie chickens on their property, but this place that we visit actually has predominantly lesser prairie chickens with one or two greater prairie chickens mixed in. So we actually get a great comparison of the two species. So here's a brief video. You can hear the uh, camera shutters in the background there. Let me turn it up a bit so you can hear the display. And they do this wonderful dance and foot stomping display. You can hear some of the booming sound in the background. In previous locations, we got distant views of the birds, but in this new spot in Kansas, they have a great height setup where we can get very close to several displaying males 
full of videos and great photos, and it's just a fantastic experience. And the birds here are, of course, on what is called a lek. It's actually a Swedish term that was incorporated into English. And this is where the males are displaying and uh, showing off to visiting females that will then select one of the dominant males. The dominant males usually have a position in the lek right in the middle. After we see the lesser prairie chickens, we continue back towards Colorado. And there are one or two good stops for the rare and declining mountain plover. And this is another short grass prairie specialist, oftentimes found in association with prairie dogs. And uh, it also has declined, but we usually have one or two spots where we can track them down. They blend in really well. They actually prefer these fallow fields where they sometimes hunker down, can be very difficult to spot. One year we actually arrived at the location right in the middle of an ice storm. You can see the uh, rim ice on the vegetation there and even some ice on the actual mountain plover. And these hardy birds just hunkered down and we were able to locate them nevertheless despite the weather and uh, we had great views. Even ice filled up on the scope and on my camera. Uh, that's how cold it was. So we got great views quickly and then moved on. This is also usually a great spot to catch up with the two prairie long spurs. Here's a beautiful male chestnut colored long spur. And also we can find McCown's long spurs. And we oftentimes get great views of them on the ground or perched up, sometimes by the hundreds or occasionally even by the thousands, depending on the weather. And then we head on to Ray in the northeast corner of the state. And here we look for the greater prairie chicken. You can see in this aerial image, the uh, round green areas are cornfields mostly, and then in between you get these hilly sandy areas that still support native prairie. The ranch we visit to see this species actually uh, supports more than 100 leks, so it's doing quite well in this part of Colorado. But overall, of course, the greater prairie chicken has also declined. It's still much more widespread than the lesser counterpart, but the far eastern subspecies known as the heath hen has unfortunately gone extinct and the atwater subspecies of the coastal plains of Texas, for example, only survives in a captive breeding program and releases. But in this particular area of Colorado, the greater prairie chicken can still be found in numbers. So we head out to the lake very early, uh, so you might ask yourself what's early. In this case, we leave around five to get there just before sunrise. Um, most uh, departures are actually not that early during the tour, except for one where we leave at 4.30, but we have some at six o'clock. So it varies, and it's not as early as some people expect. In this case, we actually watch the birds from the vehicle. We can drive right up to the edge of the lake, and oftentimes surrounded by up to 30 or 40 greater prairie chickens. Soon enough after we arrive, they start displaying. Here's a male on full display. And you can see the color of the air sac is the same color as the comb. So it's much more yellow uh, compared to the lesser prairie chicken. Also, the bird is darker overall with heavier barring on the underparts. And as they display, they oftentimes end up in squabbles where two males will sort of face off and then have these aerial duels. Uh, really fascinating to watch. In terms of behavior and photographic opportunities and just enjoying the birds up close, this is definitely one of the best legs of the tour. It's absolutely magical to listen to them booming and waiting for the sun to come up and then the uh, shapes, these dark blobs running around on the prairie, slowly take on form and turn into these wonderful birds. One year we even had snow on the ground when we visited and here are two males fighting in the snow. Made for great photos, of course. Here's a male displaying right at sunrise on the snow. And despite the cold temperatures that time and the heavy snow cover, the birds displayed nevertheless. They're really hardy birds. Although I must say it is a boom or bust species. Uh, they tend to be short-lived, uh, have high predation rates, and the winters can be harsh on them. So it is important to maintain large populations so that the overall population uh, doesn't become threatened. Here's a nice overview of the lek in general. You can see in the foreground there to the right, 
three males are displaying to one female that's hunkered down uh, among them. And here you can see a bit of the display. Uh, somewhat similar to the lesser prairie chicken with lots of foot stumping. Let me see whether you can hear some of the sounds. So they have this low booming sound and then these whoop calls that they give periodically. An alternate name that some taxonomies use is actually pinnated grouse, but I think personally I prefer the greater prairie chicken. It's a wonderful experience. In this area we can also oftentimes see a pronghorn, a native antelope uh, of North America. That's quite common in these short grass prairies. And then we start our drive west back towards the Rocky Mountains. So we head from Ray to Silverthorn, and which is right in the heart of the Rocky Mountains. Along the way to Silverthorn, we can often find bighorn sheep to add to the mammal list. I should add here that this is a great trip for mammals, and we oftentimes see up to 30 species with uh, many really neat mammals possible. In Silverthorn, uh, we spend one night and we use this as a base to visit Loveland Pass. Uh, you can see it up in the upper right hand corner of the image here. And this is the highest elevation we reach on this tour actually, almost 12,000 feet. And we go up here very early in the morning to look for the white-tailed ptarmigan. This is uh, one of the trickiest chickens, uh, as I like to call them, on this tour. And uh, it's fairly unpredictable, but so far we've had a 100% success rate. Sometimes they're fairly easy to find, sometimes it takes some time looking. Here you can see they're still in their immaculate winter plumage, completely white. And basically you're looking for these little black dots, which could be the eye or the bill, uh, sticking out from the snow. Uh, depending on the weather, they can be really tucked into the snow, or they may be more active. And even when it's sunny up here, it is still very, very cold. Uh, probably the coldest day of the tour. So what we do is we drive up early, make sure everybody's bundled up, and then um, stay close to the, the pass, the parking lot. We don't wander around too much. And then uh, we carefully search the area to see whether we can find a pair of these. And once we find them, we can oftentimes get great views. They're fairly approachable. Here you can see a few gray feathers showing through in the neck as this bird is going to eventually uh, obtain breeding plumage. Here's a view of a pair that was wandering right up to us. That's the amazing thing about these birds is they're very difficult to locate, but once you find them, they're not shy at all, uh, sometimes actually walking straight towards the observer. And here's a short video showing uh, one feeding. And what they key in on are these willows that stick out from the snow and picking up the willow buds. But you can see if this bird will not be moving at all, it just looks like a lump of snow, white on white. Um, always a great relief when we find it. And here you can see a very happy group after we were successful once again right up on Loveland Pass. And you can see everybody's really bundled up. It looks sunny, but that is deceiving. Um, if the wind picks up at 12,000 feet, it can be very cold. But we always uh, take our time and um, we do some of the leg work and usually can find them. After that, we head back down to Silverthorn for a well-earned and warm breakfast. And then we do a little bit more birding in the Silverthorn area. We head just a little bit west of town. And we can see some of the Rocky Mountain songbirds here, um, like dark-eyed juncos. Uh, we can find several subspecies, like the gray-headed subspecies, or the pink-sided. We also usually see Oregon dark-eyed juncos. And uh, out east, we actually see slate-colored dark-eyed juncos, too. Red-breasted nuthatches are around, of course. 
And then the more uh, Western specialty, the pygmy nuthatches are around. Mountain chickadees are quite common up in the Rockies. And sometimes you can even find black-capped chickadees alongside mountain chickadees, although black caps usually found in more low elevations. And then we have a good chance of red crossbill. Uh, if we don't find them here, we can find them later in the tour. Um, some years they're quite common, other years they're uncommon, but we usually bump into some of them uh, somewhere along the route. And here, oftentimes around Silverthorne, there's a merlin, probably keying in on the abundance of uh, winter finches uh, coming to feeders there. So we oftentimes find merlin uh, right on the edge of town. And the American red squirrels, of course, are also present up in the Rockies. And one year we actually arrived at the site uh, where there's a small feeder set up and somebody said that was a really strange squirrel that just jumped up that feeder and we waited a bit and this American Martin came back. A great mammal to get. That was the first time we saw this mammal on tour and uh, it was a big surprise and it came back several times to the bird feeder to, to feed on bird seed. So really need to see it so well. And from Silverthorne, we have a beautiful drive down to the Gunnison Basin, crossing several passes uh, and valleys, and it's just all around scenic the entire stretch. And we go, uh, we have a good chance of seeing several species of woodpeckers in a very short amount of time. We'll of course find the widespread hairy woodpecker, and then oftentimes we can find red nape sapsuckers here, beautiful male. Uh, they have just arrived from further south. And one of the western specialties, uh, there's a great spot for Lewis's woodpecker. A very beautiful and unusual woodpecker spends lots of time flying around, uh, fly catching, very similar to uh, what you see sometimes red-headed woodpeckers doing in the east. But the beautiful Lewis's woodpecker uh, is present in some of the valleys. And then as we head up uh, to higher elevations before we reach Gunnison, We'll uh, head out into the snowy coniferous forest here and we'll look for the American three-toed woodpecker. He is a wonderful male that showed really well. Um, fairly uncommon species uh, overall, but Colorado is a great place to catch up with it. In one of the valleys, we have a great chance of seeing the nomadic pinion jay. Uh, they can be uh, very tricky to find, but there's a location where they are, seem to be largely resident. We can sometimes find flocks of 50 of these beautiful powder blue jays. And to stay with the blue color here, there are also mountain bluebirds nesting in that area. They're fairly common that time of year. And then we head into Gunnison where we spend two nights. Um, this makes the trip a lot easier actually and more restful and it's a wonderful place to spend an extra night. And then we start out for our earliest start of the tour. We leave at 4.30 to head out and try to see one of the rarest species of birds in North America, the Gunnison sage grouse. Uh, likely less than 2,000 individuals left worldwide. Most of them are found here in the Gunnison Basin with a small population in Utah and some other Colorado counties. But this is the best place to see it. And we enter the uh, a large hide, sort of a large metal box, and this is also a very cold morning because we arrived before sunrise, uh, but we're all bundled up, bring some blankets, and then we wait uh, as the uh, sagebrush step slowly wakes up in front of us. So this basin is kind of in a rain shadow and supports this high elevation sagebrush desert, uh, which is of course the favored habitat of the Gunnison sage grouse. And when I first went to this site, uh, you could actually see the sage grouse in this sort of flat area on the foreground of this image here. But over the last couple of years, they've moved away from the viewing area and they now oftentimes display right on top of that ridge, that first ridge you see in this image. And the views are quite distant, but you can oftentimes still see the identifying features. And here's actually uh, a digiscope image of two, two males displaying on that ridge. And um, it looks really different. They look uh, really far, I should say. And uh, they look like little dots there. 
but you can still see the distinctive head plumes. Um, they have more and thicker plumes than the greater sage grouse. They're a little bit smaller and the banding pattern on the tail is different. So here's actually a video I got a digiscoping. Not easy to see, but right in the center of the frame here there is a male sage grouse uh, standing completely still displaying. And if you look sort of up left a little bit from that, you can see one walking across the snow and it will become more visible in a second. Fortunately, during my last visit um, last year, the sage grouse had, had actually moved closer to the blind again, uh, again displaying that valley right in front of the blind. And we had great views of several males and including females. And hopefully the species is a bit on a rebound and in coming years we'll get closer views. But either way, this is the best place and the best time of year to see no, this no, endangered it. species. After we see the sage grouse, we head on up to the Crested Butte area to catch up with some winter finches. Colorado is a great place to see all three species of rosy finches. Uh, brown cap, which is the um, resident nesting species in that part of the Rockies, is the most common one. Uh, almost all of these in this image are brown cap rosy finch. There's a single black rosy finch mixed in. And of course we also see the gray crowned rosy finch. So all three species are present, including su two subspecies of gray crowned rosy finch. Here's a bit of the feeding frenzy. This is right after a snowstorm. So very active. And here's a better image of a uh, black rosy finch. So it takes a bit of searching sometimes, but we can usually pick out all three rosy finches. And for some reason, every time we go up to Crested Butte, uh, we also have excellent chances of seeing red fox in that area and uh, American Dipper along some of the streams as we go higher up into the mountains. Then we spend another night in Gunnison and then visit the Black Canyon of the Gunnison National Park, a wonderful scenic area. And this is our target. Uh, chicken for the morning, the dusky grouse. Uh, of course, the blue grouse was split into dusky grouse and then the more western sooty grouse. And here is a nice male displaying in a bit of a snow flurry. And most years uh, we can get great close views of them. This is another one of these grouse species that once you find them, they are very approachable. And here's a male displaying right by the roadside in uh, more warmer conditions. And this is another great place for raptors. The, the cliffs of the gorge support nesting uh, golden eagles. Here you can see a immature golden eagle having a bit of a squabble with a territorial red-tailed hawk. And we can also oftentimes find peregrine falcon and prairie falcon in this area. These uh, slate-colored subspecies of the fox sparrow breeds in this area, so we get great views of those. They're still fairly quiet that time of year. It's a bit early, but oftentimes there are one or two territorial males present. And if we haven't seen it by then, we see the wonderful Clark's Nutcracker, of course, uh, quite a famous bird for its ability to store seeds all over the landscape and remember the locations. And uh, a wonderful uh, Rocky Mountain species. Also lots of mammals around, like these beautiful golden mantled ground squirrels. And then oftentimes we can see yellow-bellied marmots too. From Gunnison we head west towards Grand Junction. And you can see in this image up here uh, to the west of Grand Junction, a lot of red sandstone and the beautiful carved canyon of Colorado National Monument. And this next image here to the east of Grand Junction, you see this uh, green area, that's the Grand Mesa. That is the um, most expansive area above 10,000 feet in Colorado and supports a good population of boreal owls. If the weather permits and if people have the energy, we can actually go up there in the evening and try to find the boreal owl, which is a very difficult bird to see. Oftentimes, um, there's even too much snow to make it up there along the road or there's too much snow to get into the forest. But with great luck, it is possible 
to see the boreal owl and always worth a try. Even hearing the distinctive call is uh, quite magical. But this is an image I've taken up there at uh, Grand Mesa of a boreal owl. The next morning we visit uh, the Colorado National Monument, again another landscape highlight of the tour. And we look for Gamble's quail, that's the chicken of the morning, uh, beautiful quail that we can often find nearby. And they're sitting up and calling early in the morning. Here's our group enjoying the views. And in this landscape we of course can also look for canyon wrens, which we can often find right along the edge of the canyon at some of the viewpoints. It's also a great place for the uncommon juniper titmouse, which we can find in the surrounding juniper woodland. And the Woodhouse scrub jay too, which uh, of course has been split from the western scrub jay. So the interior one is now Woodhouse scrub jay. And then we can continue a little bit further west and we just barely get into the range of the sagebrush sparrow. So that's a great bird to add. Uh, they have just arrived on their breeding grounds by that time of year, but it's right up against the Utah border. We have good chances of seeing this sagebrush specialty alongside with the uh, sage thrasher, which is a bit more widespread, but also a great addition for this tour. And then we spend a bit of time in the Coal Canyon. Uh, this is a really interesting area. There are mustangs or wild horses here that we can often see. And we actually have good chances of catching up with rock wrens here, which are surprisingly not that common uh, in that part of Colorado, but we can often find a pair here. And we also look for the non, for non-native chicken, the chucker actually, native to the uh, Himalayas and other parts of Asia. And uh, it was introduced to Western North America. It's doing quite well in some areas, uh, especially in these rocky canyons. Some years they're fairly easy to find, other years they're very difficult. They like to be up uh, among the boulders on the steeper slopes and they can hide quite well. But with luck we may end up with views like this. This is a male chucker. Quite a large bird actually, uh, a lot larger than our native quail. And then we head up to Craig um, in the northwestern corner of the state. And uh, there we go look for sharp-tailed grouse. Uh, that's one of the more widespread species of grouse, actually ranges all the way up into Alaska, but we have good chances of seeing them displaying here. Again, this was a very uh, snowy season, and uh, we were able to find them. Uh, they were not as active, but we did find some males displaying close to the road, got some great views. Uh, one of them even ended up flying up onto a telephone wire and set up there for half an hour, I assume just to get out of the snow. And for some reason, this is also the best spot to see uh, song sparrows on the tour, which again are just barely arriving during that time of year. Uh, most of the sparrows are still to the south of Colorado in early April, which comes a bit as a surprise to people uh, that are more used to migration starting in April. But uh, in Colorado, it's quite late. Um, we only see a few uh, early short distance migrants during the tour. Sometimes swallows, uh, we've even had gray flycatcher or a broad-tailed hummingbird here and there. But uh, migration has not uh, started quite by that time. But it is, of course, the best time for displaying grouse and the winter finches. Talking about winter finches, uh, if we haven't seen them by then, there's a great spot, uh, backup location for the uh, beautiful evening grosbeak and also the pine grosbeak represented by a distinct uh, Rocky Mountain subspecies here. And then we drive up to Walden. Um, we really get into some wonderful empty and wild country here. We can often find American badgers along the way. And they uh, are often associated with Wyoming ground squirrels, which they try to dig up uh, for prey. But American badger, uh, we usually see one, at least one on every tour. Wonderful animal. Walden is a very small town. We stay at a local hotel there with a great local restaurant. And then we head out for the last lek, the last morning of the tour. And this is a fantastic experience and sort of the perfect finish to this tour. And we uh, go to see greater sage grouse on the lek. And this is a really neat lek because it has a lot of birds. Uh, I've counted up to 120 birds at once 
usually we can expect more between 70 or 80, but uh, beautiful landscape. And we're out there early before sunrise, of course, and the sun usually comes up uh, perfectly behind us, lighting up this scene of several males displaying, and you can see a cluster of females in the middle there. Here's a close-up image of a female bird. Uh, of course, again, they, they visit the lek site to choose the, the mates, and the dominant males will be near the center of the lek. And here you can see a male in display, and they um, make a deep, a booming sound, blowing up the air sacs, and then making a popping sound as they throw their head forward. And you can see the plumes on this bird are, um, they're not as many, and they're sort of uh, thinner, whereas in a Gunnison sage grouse, there'd be uh, many more plumes and um, sort of thicker looking overall. And then we can also see some of the other mammals. Uh, I didn't get to mention yet, we actually cover so much of Colorado, we enter the range of three different species of prairie dogs. And I always enjoy pointing them out to everybody. In the east, we see black-tailed prairie dogs. In the Gunnison Basin, we see the Gunnison prairie dog. And here in northwestern Colorado, uh, we see the white-tailed prairie dog. This is an image of a white-tailed prairie dog right here. And then we start our drive back to Denver, and if we haven't seen it yet, we make a stop for Bear's Goldeneye, um, beautiful male here. Uh, overall, this is a great tool for waterfowl. Uh, we can expect pretty much any uh, waterfowl that migrates through um, the center of the continent during this time of year, uh, including cinnamon teal, uh, common mergansers, uh, common golden eyes, of course. And we do make several stops at lakes and reservoirs to look for waterfowl, gulls, and so on. And then during our last stop, this is actually near Denver, we'll try to get one more uh, woodpecker, another western specialty, the uh, Williamson sapsucker. Here's a great image of the male. Uh, this was during our last tour last year, actually. And then we arrive in Denver, where we will have a... Uh, celebratory dinner before saying our goodbyes. So I hope you enjoyed this overview and uh, learned a little bit uh, more detail about this tour. If you have any questions or comments, uh, please feel free to leave those and I'll try to answer any questions you may have. Until next time, take care.